website throughout the week for news and summary reports from the event. Additionally, recordings and presentations from the conference will be available on the West website. Before we begin this morning's program, we would like to recognize the many sponsoring companies who helped make it possible to bring this important event to San Diego. We would particularly like to acknowledge West's premier sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Appian. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please join me in welcome to the stage, Brigadier General Paul Fredenberg, U.S. Army retired, Executive Vice President for National Security and Defense, AFSIA International. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here this morning. I trust everyone had a great first day. This place was buzzing yesterday, and if you think it was good yesterday, buckle up. Uh, it's going to be even better today and tomorrow. I hope you've come this morning ready to engage with our speakers, our exhibitors, and your fellow attendees here. And I certainly would not take anything away from the formal uh, agenda that we have but the networking that you're conducting here, the ideas you're exchanging, and the connections you're making in that exhibit hall out here are a very important piece of your overall West 2023 experience. Now going back to our conference theme, U.S. maritime strategy emphasizes that the domain is integral to the security and prosperity for America and all nations. And it calls for the cooperation among the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard to conduct successful maritime operations. The sessions at this conference are exploring how we prepare for a future in which unmanned systems, artificial intelligence, hypersonic weapons, cyber operations, and laser weapons may determine who controls the seas. And we're also exploring how we make sure modernization efforts in the United States and its allies are able to develop maritime readiness, capabilities, and capacities that can counter adversaries such as the People's Republic of China. And our keynote this morning is going to take a look at that from both a military and an industry perspective. And I'm excited to hear what they have to say. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator, of this morning's panel, Vice Admiral James Zortman, U.S. Navy retired, Chairman of the Board, USAA. Jim Zortman served 34 years in the U.S. Navy. His last assignment was Commander Naval Air Forces and Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific Fleet. He was a senior executive at Northrop Grumman for eight years, serving as Senior Vice President for Global Logistics and Operational Support. He is currently the chairman of the board at USAA, a Fortune 100 financial services company. He is also a senior advisor at the Boston Consulting Group. He's a past chair of the National Naval Aviation Museum Foundation, the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation, and the San Diego Strategic Roundtable. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Admiral Zortman and the panel. Hey, thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, thanks. For, uh, I really appreciate that introduction and uh, I, I guess you didn't get my request because I had asked for the walk-up music to be Bad Bunny. Uh, so I, I don't know if that got lost in the Naval Institute. Um, myself and the panel really appreciate the chance to have this session this morning. And uh, we're going to go for about an hour. Uh, and I, after several really quick intros, I'm going to ask the panel members uh, some questions uh, that hopefully will get us pretty quickly and pretty directly to the issues that uh, the Naval Institute and AFC have asked us to address. 
as a view from industry. And I think it's important to stress that from the start of this is this is a view from industry. Now, we're going to have a discussion up here based on some questions, but then in order to get to the things that uh, hopefully we stir up or that are on your mind, we're going to take the last 20 or 25 minutes and uh, take questions from the, from the floor that uh, the panel members will ask. So I, I think you've all had a chance to look at the, uh, the bios of the people that are up here today, but I'll, I'll just hit it real quickly. Uh, starting on the left over there, Roy Trigger Kelly, uh, VP of Washington Ops for Naval Power and uh, Requirements and Capabilities for Raytheon Missile and Defense. Uh, Trigger started life as a Tomcat pilot, uh, commanded at basically all the levels that uh, went uh, finishing up his time, mainly in the cockpit of the F-18. Uh, he's run most of the big pieces of uh, naval aviation, uh, Air Lant, uh, Sinatra, where the aviators are trained, a battle group, commanded at the air wing and the squadron level. Um, he really works at Raytheon to align what the, the customer says they need to what Raytheon is producing. Kevin Mickey, uh, right next to Trigger. Uh, Kevin's a sector vice president and uh, general manager of future air dominance at Northrop Grumman. Uh, Kevin's got 30 plus years of building, building stuff, building airplanes, building spacecraft. Um, he's done it in big programs as a big prime, but also some of the things that you read about that do amazing things like win the Ansari Prize uh, for space flight from a commercial uh, base. Uh, Kevin's got a lot of experience in both commercial and uh, aeros defense aerospace. Uh, he's also the son of a Marine, so we'll give him a pass on that for today. Uh, next to Kevin, uh, Nasty Manazer. Uh, I think a lot of people in this room probably know Nasty as a well-known author. Uh, I will not shamelessly plug his, uh, his latest book, but uh, he's a vice president at, at, for Navy Systems and Government Operations uh, in Boeing uh, Defense Space and Security. Uh, like Trigger, he started out life as a Tomcat pilot uh, and spent a lot of time at all levels of command in naval aviation, including uh, a nuclear aircraft carrier. Uh, Nasty is unique in a lot of ways, but uh, one of the ones that uh, I think is uh, going to be particularly useful in our discussion today is he had five, count them, five tours in the Pentagon. And so he's been on all sides of the uh, requirement and acquisition system. And then to my immediate left, uh, Joe DiPietro, uh, Vice President at Lockheed Martin Integrated Warfare Systems and Sensors. Uh, if, if you want to know uh, about where the foremost combat system in the world is, is built and how it's built, uh, Joe's your guy. Uh, he's, he's building uh, not just that, but a lot of other advanced combat systems and the sensors that go with it. He's got a, a strong background starting out as a naval officer for about nine or 10 years uh, in the, uh, using the product out in the fleet uh, on an Aegis equipped uh, cruiser. He spent uh, a number of years in government service uh, in uh, NAVC and in POIWS, uh, learning the ropes in that part of the business. And uh, he's uh, now up on the other side of the, of the three-way stool that we're going to talk about today. I, I'm going to open with just a couple of brief remarks about uh, the view from industry. And uh, sometimes people say, if you could look into the future, what do you think the fleet will look like? in 10 to 15 years. And I can tell you almost to a T what the fleet 10 to 15 years is going to look like. It's going to look like what is in the fleet today in large numbers and in the start of small numbers with new things coming in. And the things that we have contracted for are in the process of being developed and built. Um, rewind your clock if you, if, you, if you question that and think today's 2023. If you went back to 2008 at the risk of doing public math, uh, think about what the fleet looked like and what was in the pipeline and what we see out there today. So the, the reality is we can see and we know what's coming. Um, it's, it's, that's the, the way we, we do it. It's what's the system is another question of what's going to define what's going to come for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, how are we going to define requirements? How are we going to turn those into programs and contract for them? What's the system we're going to use for that? 
we're going to use the system we've got today. Uh, you can go into the library in the Pentagon someplace, and there's probably a bookshelf that's got uh, all of the studies that have been done for the last 40 or 50 years about how to reform or change the defense acquisition system uh, in all of its aspects. And while there have been, uh, I would call, some, some tweaks to the system, we've essentially got the system that we've had for the last 15 years. And absent some very, very significant event, it's the system we're going to operate going forward. So I, I would contend that the thing that is going to allow us to be successful in producing the kind of systems and producing the kind of product and producing it in a timeliness that will help us not only do what we need to do, it's required to do what we need to do, is going to require a form of partnership uh, that has, in some cases, escaped us at the level we need it. Uh, the country made a decision a long time ago that uh, we don't have arsenals anymore. We buy our defense equipment, our defense systems from the commercial sector. Uh, they're publicly traded. Uh, they're uh, operating not only in the government finance system, but they're operating in the commercial financing system with the challenges and the opportunities that go along with that. So I guess the, the place I'd start our discussion today is how to make it work to do the things that need to be done at the rate and at the price that we know we need to do. And so if we start from the position that uh, both industry and all the parts of the US government uh, are committed to the same common outcome, and that's delivering what the fleet said they need at a price schedule and the terms that they agreed to formalized in a contract. So with that as a starting point, my first question to Nasty, because he's been in a lot of the sides of this thing, is what could possibly go wrong and what could possibly go right to make us be able to be successful? Hey, thanks, Admiral. And, and I'm so humbled and honored to sit up here with the panel. Uh, thanks to West, uh, Pete, this is the perfect panel to have here. When I look out in the room, uh, I see so many friends and colleagues, uh, whether you're ex-military, you've been industry your whole life, um, that, that we, are, we are partners already. And I see this many people out here. And so uh, the Admiral, there's nothing wrong with what Admiral Zortman said about what we need to go do together. But oftentimes, we see each other differently. So let me give you two stories. So I see Owen Nimitz, uh, 2008 maintenance, right where Carl Vinson is sitting right now. And Naval Reactors tells me I have to be sort of trust the project superintendent, but sort of verify, be suspicious that he might not actually deliver to you know, the project. I said, well, that's not gonna work. And so I partnered with him directly, and so we took the ship's company and the ship's force, or all the ship folks in here, pushed them together, no difference, partnered, we're gonna get out on time, and we got out on time on December 14th of 2008, nothing wrong with the ship, and we actually took a mission the next morning to be able to go back out and do that. I had the wonderful opportunity to be the OPNAV N-98, Director of Air Warfare uh, under Admiral Richardson and Admiral Greener. Moved up to OPNAV N-9. I recognized that in order to recommend to the CNO what we needed to buy, I needed to partner with industry. Dawned on me, well, I have to go, because the defense industrial base is all of us in the room. So I had to partner with that, and I had to drive against the friction that came in when, when people said, well, it was partner, but we have to make sure we're the stewards of taxpayer dollars. We can do that. We can do our jobs. But we need to partner a lot better. And so everybody in this room is going is to absolutely agree with what Admiral Zorman said as his premise. When we walk out the door, the uniforms are going to go to their neutral corner and do what, what they think they need to do to defend the taxpayer dollars. And industry is going to go out, and we're going to get into this sort of discussion. I think if we come together, touch gloves, and say, this is what we're going to do to make this thing work so that we can look the threat in the eye and go faster. We do not have to change the DFARS. We don't have to go and change all that stuff. It doesn't require that. It requires partnership to take our system and move forward. I think we do more of that from a, from a leadership perspective. We'll start to see more results. The, um, the, the point I think that uh, is really good out of that nasty is the idea that everybody has a role. And, and probably there's no more central role uh, in industry and in uh, the government acquisition system than program managers. And here in a couple hours, uh, you're going to hear from the 
systems command commanders uh, in, a, in a panel that uh, Kevin McCoy is going to run about that workforce. But I'll, I'll, I'll kick a question to uh, Joe here. Is There's probably nothing that is more important in making this work than, than good program managers. And program managers interact at all levels. They interact in all places. Um, Joe, from your experience in both uniform and then in government service and now in industry, what is it that program managers in industry do well and can do better and how they work with their, their government counterparts? No, I appreciate that, sir. And I think, you know, it kind of feeds off of what Nasty was talking about here, which is that discussion on partnership. I think the objective outcome is aligned. I think de delivering capability on time, speed of relevance to the warfighter at the pointy end is what we're here to do. We're here to make sure that they can not only defend our liberties, but also to get home safely to their families, right? So can we corral around that mission discussion and then roll that down into what do we need to do to deliver that capability and how do we get there? They also have to take ownership of the fact that while the within the system there are things we have to satisfy, the contracts, the requirements, the et cetera, it's the translation of that. In some cases, they're the smartest people in the room to help the other sides understand the value of what we're trying to do. And you really have to engage in that opportunity. It's not just about briefing up and giving your status for your EV or your IMS schedule. It's about being able to corral that team, that integrated program team, and make sure that all the parts connect, that you understand the complexity and how that relates to the schedule, how it relates to the risk. And I think we have a lot of opportunity to do better than that. If you look at some of the most successful things we've done, it wasn't because the process was better, it was because of how the people did the work together. And I think we have a lot of opportunity space there to really partner. And yes, we have to be, all be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. We have to find a way to continuously optimize and to be able to deliver capability uh, that's affordable and relevant. But we need to do so in the reality of we're trying to go faster than we went before, and we're going to have to help push that machine uh, through that process that it goes through. So program managers have that opportunity. I think as I look back from being on both sides, I remember the relationships that I've had to be able to drive through very difficult problems that we had when we think about things like when baseline six for Aegis was keeping two ships at the pier and we needed to crowd together to figure out how to get CEC out to the fleet. And the focus of that team while they were delivering new capability in baseline seven with a dual beam radar and COTS equipment for the first time happened on the backs of the program managers that worked together to solve that problem and deliver that eye watering capability that now is the workhorse of our fleet today. Right? So how do we emulate that, that effort and recreate it as we move forward on these new efforts? So Joe, to follow up on that, if, if you were gonna say, <clears throat> here's one or two things that I would ask from your industry perspective of you would like to be able to see done better, and I'll, I'll say mainly from the industry side, but also from the, the government side, to both equip and then enable program managers to do just what you said. What, what would be those one or two things? I would say, first off, sir, you know, really rolling up the sleeves to understand what the work is and how it gets done. Get, get to the sites, see the people, see the process, understand better what industry is doing to create that capability um, is a big part of that discussion. I think the other part is, is um, it's an industry side, but it's linked, I think, to what we need from the, the program management side is we have to get the other pieces to move with it. And when I talk about that, that's not just the contract structure. We're not doing good on the illities. The training is not keeping up. The documentation is not keeping up with the process. So the receive side, as we look to move fast, my team hears me say all the time, the challenge is not slinging code, right? The challenge is making sure that we can get all the objective quality evidence we need to certify that capability, that the customer's bought in, that we have that objective quality evidence, and that there's an understanding of all those things that we need to do. I could deliver the most eye-watering capability in hardware and software, but if the sailor that's gotta press the buttons doesn't understand how to operate and employ it, then we've failed. And that's a part that we really need to work on is to link the whole thing together. Industry only controls a portion of that. Understand which part we have, understand the link to the other part, and be the person who marries all that together so that we can be successful as an integrated team. Okay, thank you. And I, I'll, uh, 
I'll ask Kevin, if he's in the audience, to maybe follow up on that same point uh, with the panel here a little bit later on uh, to have a, a balanced uh, view on that. Uh, Trigger, you've been in, been in the saddle for a, a period of time now, and um, you've probably got a fresh perspective having just come from, from the fleet and from uh, the things you were doing there, and now you're your, your job is, is to translate what the fleet is saying into a, into a thing that uh, industry can understand and ultimately act on. Um, based on your extensive year, year and a half of experience, if you could wave a wand in what you've learned, what, what would you say are the one or two things that are impeding the flow of information from what the requirement is to the the people inside industry that are executing it and how they communicate it back to the fleet to say, is this what you said you wanted and are we on the right direction? Sure, it's a great question. And first off, th thanks for allowing me to be a part of the panel. And Admiral Daly, you know, I think that uh, most folks in the audience here have, have seen the movie Top Gun Maverick and the scene that they have that's in the Air Boss's uh, conference room where not a commander is introducing Tom Cruise, and he and he he says, uh, you know, you were number one graduate of Top Gun, and Tom Cruise quickly corrects him and says, just to set expectations, I was number two. Yeah, well, I'm Jerry Huber's number two. <laughs> <laughs> but to your question, I think that uh, you know the the opportunity I had and a privilege to serve for 35 years in the Navy, and uh, uh, leaving my last command at Airland, and then moving over to Raytheon. Certainly, the perspectives have changed significantly. But I look back at, and the reason they hired me was because of experiences, as, as they have for, for Nasty and, and uh, you as well when, when you uh, were working with Northrop Grumman. So I think that they bring you on board for a reason because they want your perspective. They want to understand what you've learned in the Navy. And I think that as, as I look at the two sides, the business side now and the military side then, how does that communication work? And in some cases, it works very well. And I think it, it feeds back to uh, what's been discussed up here, and Nasty brought up specifically, when you've got good teamwork together, then the communication flows well. When, when there's barriers that are, are put up, and some of those barriers are because of policy, some of those barriers come up because of personality differences. And I think that uh, you've gotta be able to overcome those and work around those things. Legally, of course, but the, the challenge that, that we have is trying to deliver what the fleet needs. And we are patriots up here. We want to deliver to the, the warfighter what they need as quickly as possible. I think that as you go through the process and as I've looked at it, I think that you start back in requirements and, and look at where did those requirements come from? And you know, there's the, the, the quote that I've learned now in industry is the unobtainium. And, you know, and setting unrealistic expectations for, for what those requirements are, I think that starts down the path that, that leads to discommunication or poor communication. Because if you create these requirements in a vacuum without using industry, who your experts are, then I think you're missing an opportunity. So I think as I look at you know, where's the communication really need to start, it's got to start as you set those requirements. And if you're not using industry to help set those requirements, then probably missing a great opportunity. One of the, uh, the things that uh, gets talked about a lot, and it's a, it's a hot button issue, and uh, I think it's uh, something that uh, we probably don't talk about enough in terms that um, are using nouns and verbs, it, it quickly gets into legal uh, jargon is contracting. Um, and contracting is the way that uh, we document what we agree to is our common goal. And what makes a good contract in a lot of cases is, is plain language, but the tendency in a contract is, is to cover every contingency and go to everything that could possibly go bad to the point that the intent and sometimes the outcome we're trying to get to uh, is, is lost. Kevin, you've, you've uh, been in the defense aerospace and the commercial aerospace business for a long time and you've operated under multiple contracting uh, schemes, everything from 
a handshake from a billionaire, will you build this for me, to uh, the, the contract that probably stacked up that, that high. Have you any thoughts on what makes a good contract and how a contract can work to everybody's advantage? Sure. Let me let me start with uh, like the others. It's an honor to be up here. So thanks uh, thanks for the invitation to to speak on this topic. Uh, you, you're right. Uh, through my career, I've had the opportunity to see uh, contracts that are, are three pages, like they were back in the Kelly Johnson days, and and to see the the, the legal boxes uh, full, right? But it's it's about the intent. I used to have a our attorney used to say that a good contract reminds friends what they signed up to do, right? And we need to create an, uh, an environment in, in, down within our contractual uh, partners in the, in the services that understand that we're, we're trading now, given the threat, speed for, for perfection, right? You can always find in that legal box full of contracts a way to, to pinch a contractor, right? It's about the intention. We've, we've heard the thematic up here of partnership time and time again. It is about that partnership, and, and I always feel at the, at the flag level, at the senior levels, we have that partnership. It's how do you drive that intent down into the organization so that they recognize, and it doesn't always feel this way, so that they recognize that we're on the same team, right? We, we start the day, to your point, we're patriots. We start the day on the same side of the table, right? We all get up in the morning uh, trying to do our very best for the warfighter. It, it's that partnership that's gonna drive us in the interpretation of that contract to get things done, to get things delivered. We use a term on, on big program that we're working now, it's called active contract management, if you will. What that really says is that you're partnering with your customer to actively look at ways to drive risk left, to make decisions real time, to be more flexible. We're really fond of, of agile software methodologies these days, which says that there's a lot of flexibility. Why can't there be some agility in that contracting mechanism, right, so that you can have that partnership and drive that down into delivering hardware and proving you wrong, sir, that it looks different in 15 years? That's our job. You know, I might, might just add, yeah. so could not agree more. Also want to emphasize on our side, we do the same things as, as uh, Kevin talked about. We, we drive problems into the contracting process on our side. So if we can develop this, this shared uh, commitment to speed and use that active contracting method, and we, we're pointing at each other, you've got to go through the contracting officer for the legal things. That's exactly correct on both sides, but don't let us tell you all that the uniformed contracting officers are the ones that are the problem. We have a shared problem, and we've got to be able to figure out how to break through that. That's and right. I see it just quite a bit. Yeah. Is, it, is it fair to say that uh, contracting, uh, as Kevin uh, described it is a is a way to memorialize or to set down in writing what the executive leadership of both the government acquisition and the commercial company have agreed to do and while the contracting officers play a very very important role the intent and the um, and the ongoing uh, communication on contracting is really the role of the program manager and the senior executive leadership. And I'd, I'd ask Joe um, to comment on that. In other words, my, my maybe inflammatory way of saying that is contracting is too important to be left to contracting officers. Well, uh, thanks for that one. <laughs> um, as part of the process and, uh, you know, as I think about oh, what my colleagues up here have said and just the privilege to be up to here with them. But I think, you know, to, to your point on that, I think we, we do it to each other. We get so fixated. I, I will tell you internally, right, to share the problem is, is very quickly, right after something comes in, someone can tell me the exact number of shall statements there are inside the product that they receive from the customer, right? And I think to the point that we were talking about earlier, which is what are we objectively trying to achieve from a mission capability perspective? Those are the guidelines. Those are the rules for which we need to follow in order to do that and to put that in place and to mind and make sure that we're doing all the right things with the right deliverables that are in that contract. But I go back to that discussion on the understanding of what that translates to for what industry needs to create. Those program managers and the technical directors on the US government side and the engineers on the industry side, they are the best ones to understand how they're going to achieve that. And when they can agree to that and not turn everything into a contracting action, 
that that deliverable will suffice, um, then I think we can move faster through that process. I do think too that we are working on a lot of things to go faster. And I, I, I love the comment brought up about agile contracting and the agile development piece. It, it is the receive side as we try to move and implement these things to move faster, we have to find a way to work together to align it. Uh, you know, when we work on things and we're gonna do, say, hey, we do a big review or something of that nature, I, I'd like to get out of printing a thousand PowerPoint charts and inviting a hundred people to the facility to do that. We do model-based systems engineering and we can share the model and we can work in the model together and satisfy that requirement and save the taxpayers dollars and achieve what they're asking for in the contract. So we just have to think about it a little differently. And when I think we corral around that as, as the leadership team, as the program managers and the senior leaders of the programs and PEOs get together, we can achieve it. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question up here and then if, uh, we're gonna enter the part of the program where uh, we're gonna be looking for questions from uh, the people that are in the audience here because uh, hopefully we've raised some questions or you came equipped with some questions that you'd like to get uh, the opinion on uh, this group from. And I'll, I'll start by over on the left-hand side uh, with Trigger to do the one-liners here uh, while the mob lines up. If you got to um, say one thing that you'd like the group to take away from the several hundred people in the room walk out today, what is the one thing from the industry view that you would wish that they would do or that they would take away so you could go back and tell the boss, I told him this and I think it resonated. So Trigger, you go first. So I think that as, as we look at, at uh, and, and kind of back to the contracting discussion, if, if I were to say we need to have a steady demand signal, uh, that would probably be one of the biggest solutions to our problems. A sine wave and specifically with Raytheon as munitions. As we look at, you know, weapons have been bill payers for many years. Suddenly the demand is up and, and as you go through that sine wave, it's incredibly difficult for industry to try to keep the people on board, to keep the systems, the, the designs of the factories all aligned to meet demand if it's ever changing. So, you know, the one thing I think that I would advertise is to say, if you can come to us with a multi-year, if you can come to us with some type of contracting process that allows for a fairly steady demand, it would help enormously. Kevin? I think for me, uh, it's transparency, it's, it's passion, and it's partnership. And we've used, we've used that partnership word a, a, a number of times, right? If, if we are recognizing that we are both on the same team and that we are both striving to do the same thing, which is, is to do the very best for the warfighter. We come at every problem with that in mind. That sets the stage for how we can go accomplish things. We both have work to do. Uh, just a quick story, uh, you know, first time I, I met with the uh, current air boss, uh, he had a long list of, of things uh, that he needed me to work on. And he, he, uh, he talked to me about those things pretty passionately, right? And, uh, and he was right, to, to Nasty's point. Uh, we have our own challenges internally went back and fixed some of those things and came back the second time uh, with things that, that he could work on. And there was some, there was some emotion in the room, right? Not, not from the air boss, but from others who, who uh, maybe didn't want to get as real as, uh, as, as uh, we needed to in, in, that, uh, in that setting. But we talked about those things, uh, went and worked on those things. And then in the third meeting, we're, we were celebrating successes, right? So again, just speaks to the partnership that we all want as industry because we want to deliver for the warfighter. Totally agree, sir, with the two points. Uh, I would say uh, perspective. We're looking inward here, talking about how, you know, risk, blah, blah, blah. You heard the PAC lead commander yesterday. The wolf's not at the door, the wolf's in the living room. Time is the coin of the realm, and we're wasting it. And the adversary is ahead of us. We need to focus out, figure out how to get the wolf out of the living room, back into the yard, how we can point the rifles at him. And we need to do that in this room via the stuff we just got done talking about. So I would say perspective on where the threat is, and it's not us. I think one of the things for me, and, and can't agree more with everything that was said as part of this, though, is, is doing that upfront work to create clarity, right? If we can get ourselves clear on uh, what we're trying to achieve and what the levers are we have to move at the speed of relevance, Let's get that laid out. Let's have that understanding up front. 
Uh, let us help understand the problem we're trying to solve up front with the requirements discussion that was brought up. Let's create that clarity. Uh, I know some of it's competitive. Let industry participate across the board then and create some clarity so that when we go through, we'll get you something that you can improve more quickly so we can get started on solving the problem as opposed to talking about it. Okay, I think I see a few people moving towards microphones, so uh, ready to take the first one. And uh, why am I not surprised? <laughs> Bill Gortney, currently unemployed. <laughs> first a comment and then a question, which I know is gonna shock a few people in this audience. Nasty, that's a really red tie. It really stands out. It's only overshadowed by the glare from Trigger's head. Um, the, uh, we talk a lot about partnerships, but there are friction points. And I see one of the friction points right now that we have between industry and the Department of Defense, our IP data, the data rights discussion, where the uh, government wants uh, corporate data, which uh, industry may view as corner of the realm, it gives you your strategic advantage. So there's a debate in that. How do you all view um, the government's position? What is your position on the issue? And then where do you think the middle ground is that we can finally uh, close this down? Because this has been going on now for about close to almost 10 years. Thank you. I'm going to kick that one to Joe to start out with because I think that's a, a, a place where there's been a I won't say a conflict, but there's been a lot of experience in the area you work in. Yeah, and, and, and I would offer again, I'm, I'm going to give a perspective, I think, a little bit for me uh, from both sides, because I had this challenge as I worked in my, my different roles in PO ships or PO IWS or LCS or wherever I was, which is, I think, if there, one of the challenge from uh, the side of the government is, is we just want to assert those rights when I was on that side, and I used to ask the challenging question when I was a program manager or a technical director, what do we need and why, right? So if we could understand that better, and we couldn't communicate that to industry, it was almost a function of we just need it because we bought it. And I, again, I'm saying that not from being on this side of the curve, I'm saying it from being on the side that I spent the 20 plus years of my career on. On, the, on this other side, I think it gets down to what are those things that do give us that technical advantage do we need to protect and how does that play against when we get clear understanding of what is needed and why? If we could get to that discussion up front as opposed to I would just like your data uh, rights assertion list at the back of your proposal and anything less than GPR is a failure, um, I think we could do a lot better as an integrated team to solve this problem. Yeah, I would agree. The, uh, it goes back to the comment that Joe brought up about contracts and the way it's written, and, the, and I think we need to look really hard at the, at the deliverables in the contract because it often says you just deliver the data. You know, what is it? And it's the translation from both sides of what, what it is that, you know, government purpose rights, what they're gonna be used for, how do you protect the crown jewels that each company has when they build the platform that, that the service bought. And then, hey, I just want the data. Um, there are ways to gain access, and of course, we say we get access to data, we paid for it, we don't wanna pay again. Uh, there are proposals in a way that, that allow access to the data that still protects the IP of the companies, uh, but also gives the government what they need. And the commitment, of course, from the OEMs are going to take care of the equipment. So I think the translation of what's in the contract and then looking for modalities that keep that data fresh. If we turn over the data right now and say, here's the data that you paid for, it's going to get rapidly obsolete the first time a change goes into a drawing or something like that. If you have continuous access to data, like in the commercial world, Boeing does with our airlines. We have a thing called My Boeing Fleet, and all the airlines go into My Boeing Fleet, and they have access down into the data to maintain the airplanes they maintain, oftentimes with their own maintenance houses. I believe there is a model to be able to do that inside of DOD as well. It's also a multivariable problem, right? Um, this room is evidence of the thousands of partners that we have in industry that are also trying to protect their IP at the second level, third level, and so. We as the primes have an obligation to, to, to work through that with our partners, but that's, that presents a challenge for us as well, is to, to get our partners on board, because some of that is truly IP that they've, they've discovered in the commercial world. You know, we learned a lot about that at my time at Scale Composites. That work was done, paid for by, you know, Mr. Paul Allen or Steve Fawcett, right? And so then how you can free up that technology to be used in a, in a government application can sometimes be a, a challenge, obviously. And uh, I'll just add one thing. My, my experience with it has been um, the 
it seems like every one of them starts out as a fresh new case. Uh, it's, it's the, uh, if there was some way to start from a, from a level of defined uses and then negotiate from there, but it, it, it almost seems like uh, the people that come in the room, and this is to some degree from industry, and I think it's also some degree from uh, government acquisition, is it's people that have not done this before. And they start from a place that makes it pain, more painful probably than it needs to be. Sir. Kai Alberg, Washington State. Um, as we've seen from World War I to the Ukrainian War, wars often last longer and uh, munitions consumption vastly exceeds what is expected. My question is, what would industry need uh, to be able to create the ability to ramp up production quickly rather than after a couple of years? I mean, such a capability obviously is not free and industry is not going to create it unless somebody is willing to pay for it. But given the complexity of munitions now compared to 100 years ago, What's the feasibility and what would be necessary to have such a capability? Trigger, you want to start there? I know Raytheon is yeah. in the middle of a, a number of those questions right now. We are, we are indeed. And uh, you know, there's a, a recent article, if you haven't read it, I would in, encourage you to, it's a CSIS uh, article and it's on wartime inventories. And I think that uh, you know, there are a lot of points that are addressed in there in talking about you know, where we are as a country, comparatively speaking, to uh, some of our, our near-peer competitors. Uh, as we look at, at the process, and for munitions, unlike uh, um, aircraft or like ships, the time frame for building some of those is uh, not near as long. The, the issue becomes, and we look at it as a five-year process. So two years for the budgeting, a year for contracting, one year for your, uh, your, your suppliers, your, your uh, sub-tiers, and then a year for our actual production. So as you look at a five-year process, how do you condense that down? I think there's a lot of different ways that you can make it much faster. And, and part of it is in, in the contracting process, but you know, as you look across it, okay, well, that's, that, that's only uh, addressing something inside of a year. And I think even if you consolidate that, you're not going to deliver it that much quicker. As we look at the long lead items, the things that uh, you know, require us to, to uh, try to get for the production process, I think that if you had long lead discussions as you set requirements, and then as we looked at contracting, having the opportunity to say, okay, we understand that there's gotta be something for long lead up front. Let's get that on the table now. And once we've moved that, now let's move on with the rest of the contracting. Because until you get the long lead items, those things that are going to hold the product until it's finally assembled, we're not going to get past that. So I think that long lead items have to be addressed as part of the process, especially when you look at complex systems. Now, if you're looking at, for instance, the, the current war in Ukraine, you know, we're not taking uh, a lot of our, our exquisite weapons to send over there. Part of it is, I mean, we look at stingers and javelins, things that have been around for many years. But those are the things that they need right now. I think that if you're looking for something you want delivered tomorrow, then let's look at the t technology and the things we have in inventory today. Maybe it's an 80% solution that allows you to put the weapon in the hands of the warfighter very quickly, as opposed to taking this five-year or five-year-plus process. Hope that answers your question. I would add as well, uh the Boeing weapons, and, and Trigger brought two great points. First one is smooth demand, and then the lead time away stuff. What, what you have in the OEMs is the ability for the companies to go out on risk, and what, what the government should do is, is depend on the companies to go out on risk. We can, we can use company funds to go across the palm process, and if there's a commitment that the money's gonna come back as we go forward to get this pump prime to put the weapons out there, then we're gonna spend that money. It's the same thing with IRED and, uh, and internal company funds. If we know where you're going, we'll launch on that pause. If you're going that way, we'll launch right here and put money right there, and you keep going that direction, and we'll get the contracting and the handshakes as you go, but use the power of industry to get this started. And again, if you don't get it started, we have a time problem, as, as Trigger alluded to. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really good uh, point about um, the, you know, there's a big primes, uh, what, what, what good are they? Uh, what Nassie just said is this idea that big companies that have access into capital markets can uh, create capital uh, if they've got some level of certainty that allows 
for what he just described. Uh, they're still competing in capital markets with um, Apple and with uh, uh, everybody else that's in there. And until there's a mobilization of the economy uh, for a, a big war, that's just the reality. I think the second part is, is that um, there's a degree of, of stock and a degree of resilience that isn't the most efficient way to, to produce mm -hmm. and ultimately you pay a price for that. And as we've seen, not just in the question about uh, wartime stocks, but as we've seen when global supply chains gets, get disrupted, there's a value to resilience and there's a value to stock to take up those kind of buffer shocks. Tom. I want good to see y'all. Uh, hey, just up a couple of points here, having spent five years as a major program manager, five years as a PEO, and then four years as the head of the contract at NC on the Navy side, and now having the opportunity to kind of sit and watch this from the uh, industry side. So a couple observations. Uh, the first one is uh, fair and reasonable is in the eyes of the beholder. And so I think uh, part of the challenge is, you know, what the Navy views as fair and reasonable as a contract is often different from what industry views as fair and reasonable. So uh, my, my point is, um, I agree with all the comments on partnering, but my observation over the years has been, at the flag level, I think the partnering works, we want to work together, but it never gets driven down to the PM level and never gets down, driven down to the contracting level. So my question for industry, and if I had a chance, I would ask Kevin to ask the same question to the military side is, so what's our obligation to drive trust, not only build that trust back between us at our level, but what are we doing to drive that trust, probably more importantly, down into our organizations to the contracting officers and the PMs who are negotiating those contracts? Because I think at the end of the day, that's, that's the reason why we have the problems we have today. So like, my question is, what are you doing to drive trust down in your organizations to the PMs who are working with, with the government to get these contracts signed? Kevin, you want to take a, take a first shot at that? <clears throat> yeah. Um, not all that fond of the term empowerment, but you, you know you have to empower people to, to make decisions and you have to support those people. And I think one of, one of the reasons that people uh, find themselves in, in this trap of looking critically at every I and every T to be crossed is uh, nobody ever got fired for following the rules, right? And so the strictest interpretation of the rules and how you can employ those against the contract that you're, you're managing is I think the view that, that uh, the contracting officers take, where I think if there was a more trusting environment where they knew that with the best intentions, if things didn't go perfectly, that you had their back, that you would learn from it, that it would be unique failure, you would suffer from unique failure, not repetitive failures. But I don't think that we have a trusting environment that we as leaders always have their back. That's one of the things that was, was very unique about, um, about my experiences at, at Scaled, right? The employees knew that they could always trust that leadership was there for them, that we supported them, that we wanted to educate them if things didn't go perfectly, because they shouldn't always go perfectly. Otherwise, you're moving too slowly and, and, and taking too much time to achieve perfection when uh, speed is the new paradigm that we've got to achieve in this threat environment. Joe? Yeah, I, I think one thing, and uh, I'm more, you and I went through the class down at UNC, right, to learn the government understanding industry. And one of the things I try to articulate to our teams is, unfortunately, it's always the top 10% of the acquisition community that goes and does that. And it's not the contracting officers and the PMs and some of those other folks. So they don't, there's not necessarily a reciprocal understanding of how that risk gets balanced by industry to go do things, to move out, to make the schedules. There's not an understanding of, you know, the, the, the way that process works on our side. They, so we have to help educate them as part of a process too on how we look at those things to understand why it's fair and reasonable. If you're in this current environment for what we have going on, if we're not gonna get multi-year procurements and we're not gonna get EPA clauses, then I have more risk because that other third level supplier they can't afford to move out the way that I move out. I can only do so much, and I want to support them to make them successful, but that means I'm going to take on more risk as a big prime. And so how do we articulate that better and create that level of understanding? And I think it's incumbent on leadership on both sides to start to drive that. We're not going to all have that fortunate luxury of taking that class that you and I went to, sir. So we're going to have to make sure that that's a better understanding 
of that relationship between industry and government to go get this work done. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Kelly Welsh with the Naval Institute, retired Surface Navy. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, requirements and how the warfighter can potentially do a better job of making sure we're setting realistic requirements. A lot of those requirements are generated at the PM, PEO level. Um, and then you also spoke to the fact that from an industry perspective where you can do better and fill those gaps is um, on delivering on those requirements as it relates to the illities, the training, the documentation. And um, kind of going just one step further on the previous question, I'm wondering how industry is engaging the warfighter at the E5, E6 button pusher level, O1 to O3, who's flying the aircraft, fighting the ship. So how are you engaging at that level to make sure that the requirements make sense, that you're delivering on the requirements and the operators can implement the equipment and the resources? Um, and then what can the warfighter do to increase the relationship at that level? I, I'm going to start real quick on that, and then I'm going to kick this to Nasty. And I, I, I think what you've described is a really big gap in what uh, the way that requirements get identified, ultimately documented, turned into programs, and put under contract. Uh, there has been, I think, uh, artificial barriers established between the third class petty officer that's working on the flight deck or working in the hangar bay at two o'clock in the morning and the people who are designing the follow-on systems. And that's a, that's a place that has huge, huge uh, areas for improvement. And I think it, it's, it's something that the, uh, the authorities exist to do that today. So I'm going to kick it to Nasty to be more specific than that. Yeah, thanks, Admiral. And Kelly, you're, you're, it was wonderful to see you. you. You've hit the nail on the head. We, for the MQ-25 uh, unmanned refueler Boeing is building, uh, Bullet Miller, when he was CNAF, really pressed hard. There's two requirements, two, two requirements. Get on and off the carrier and give gas. And then when we go to build it, um, it goes down to the communities. And it's interesting that we must understand there are essentially three audiences that, that are out there that we work with. One is, is the fleet, like you talked about. Two is the acquisition community. And for, for Navy, that's down at Pax River, Air Force up at, at, uh, at Dayton. Uh, and then there's the requirements, folks, again, for Navy. It's in the Pentagon. And understanding what, what audience you are talking to is really critical from an industry perspective. At Boeing, we have reps on the flight lines everywhere that are out talking to the folks and we're assessing whether the product works and they say, hey, I'd like to see this. Okay, roger that. Now you come up and try to translate that into the other audiences and it starts to become really difficult to translate what the warfighter wants with what's on the contract with acquisition to what's a requirement in N98 to go make that work. So what we have to do a better job of is communicating that that stuff. Now, right now, Admiral Paparo and Admiral Aquilino are screaming for capability out in the West, and they can yell from Hawaii into Washington, D.C., and it goes into the whoosh. Now we got to put it in process, the palm process that Trigger talked about. So it's that translation, and I don't think it's that we're not contacting those audiences. It's, it's the ability to translate between the, the fleet who has a need, the acquisition community that is giving that, that need to the warfighter based on the checks that they're being written in the Pentagon and to understand how those things all play. But industry has to be able to communicate inside the company when the field marketing folks are talking to the folks on the flight line and the, the folks that are down in PACs are talking to PACs and the people going to the Pentagon are talking about requirements. Now we've got to make all that stuff work to be able to deliver to the warfighter. So it's, I think it's a question of translation. Trigger, I think you had something, and then we'll... I do, and, and I, I agree with what you're saying, Nasty. I think also, as we look at you know, where do we engage from industry to the government, I think that, that you're right. It's not just for aviation in 98 or in 96 or in 97 in the OPNAV staff, but it's also looking at the users and getting a chance to hear directly from the, the trigger pullers. And we've had that opportunity. We take advantage of it every time we can. So getting in with the, uh, the tactics instructors, weapons and tactics instructors. So for instance, I know we've, we've had some teams out at Nautic recently trying to uh, talk to those folks that are using these and see the modeling that's out there, see where our shortfalls are in comparison to near peers and then how we can try to overcome that. And some of that is with you know, technology that we have right now and trying to, once again, 
put those weapons in the hands of users as quickly as possible, as opposed to, okay, let's go back and now we're gonna build this thing that's gonna take you know, f at least a five year process, as opposed to, hey, we've got an 80% solution right now, what do you think of this, how can we modify it? And I think that's where the interface works very well, where we have a chance to uh, be on uh, the flight lines or uh, down at the piers talking to the folks that actually use the systems and see what do you really need and then talking to the folks that are the, the tactics instructors that know what the, the capabilities we have compared to our near peers are and how we can improve it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our final question. Please welcome <laughs> General Fredenberg back to the stage. Nice work. Get some bad bunny in there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in today's challenging times, this is the exact conversation that needs to take place. As we set the conditions to deliver the capabilities and capacity uh, that our military needs to outpace our adversaries. On behalf of AFSI International and the U.S. Naval Institute, thank you all for taking your time to come out here and give us the industry's perspective. This is critical. And uh, I would like to present a book uh, to each of you, uh, Mastering the Art of Command uh, by Trent Home. Thank you very much. I was afraid it was going to be Nasty's book at first. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's great. These are all laid. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into a coffee break in the exhibit hall, sponsored by Ceiling Technologies. Coming up at 10.15 will be a panel session. What is the acquisition workforce doing to better deliver warfighting capability the fleet needs to win at speed and scale at a cost we can't afford? There are also presentations in the theaters and the innovation showcase throughout the day. Check the app for the most up-to-date schedule and the full list of sessions and speakers. <laughs>